and Christiane will uh, talk about optimally controlled quantum discrimination and estimation once uh, we see her screen. I don't see anything yet. Yeah, I'm still trying to share it. And maybe let me take this opportunity and also thank Christiane for organization of all uh, schools, but also of the whole Cusco event in general, so that we can actually listen to all these very interesting talks. So with this, thanks, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And um, it's a pleasure to give us uh, to give you some updates about our uh, current um, activities and optimal control for quantum sensing. And let me start uh, by emphasizing a point that um, you probably all are aware of, but um, a point that nevertheless sometimes is not uh, fully appreciated. So what do we mean when we say quantum control? We mean the control of quantum systems, and that means um, we have resources at our hand, namely interference or the fact that quantum um, objects are matter waves and are subject to the superposition principle, and uh, entanglement. So for interference, it means that because you have the superposition principle, you have relative phases, and you can use this and tune the relative phases um, as an agent um, of control. And similarly for uh, entanglement. And then we have control knobs that are our external fields that can be either also quantum, as we have just heard in the talk by uh, Patrice, or that can also be classical. And the main point is that uh, the kind of control that we are doing uh, here in, in Cusco is that um, we, we consider both quantum and classical fields, but we typically do not account for the measurements. So we are really focused on what is called open loop uh, quantum control. And um, this type of quantum control is very closely tied together with the field of quantum technologies because also quantum technologies um, seek to exploit the quantum properties of nature, the, the, the main two quantum features, namely the coherence of matter waves and entanglement, and try to exploit these for technological applications such as uh, computing, cryptography, and so on. And what we're focusing on uh, in this network and in this uh, conference is quantum sensing. And uh, you probably also all know that um, decoherence is our uh, typically our enemy because it destroys the useful quantum properties that we want to utilize for quantum technologies. So when we speak about quantum control for quantum technologies, um, we really are considering the control of open quantum systems. And that is an interesting field uh, in and by itself. So even if you're a theoretician who doesn't care too much about the techno technological aspects, um, this field has something in for you because there are really a lot of fundamental questions which are still open uh, once we consider a quantum system that interacts with its environment and at the same time is subject to external control fields. And these open questions are what are viable quantum control strategies? We only know a handful, really. Um, how do these depend on the uh, properties of the environment and or the coupling? And what are fundamental limits to quantum control once we consider open quantum systems? And while as I said, most of the time we think of uh, decoherence as our um, enemy. We should also keep in mind that sometimes there is a dissipation-enabled control, such as uh, cooling or qubit reset. I just mentioned it here. It's not something I will uh, focus on today. So our tool, and our, I mean now within the Cusco network, our favorite uh, tool for this is quantum optimal control. And quantum optimal control starts from defining um, the objective in terms of a, a goal functional, where we say we have an initial state that evolves 
under the action of some external control to a final time uppercase t and then we want to match it with our desired target state. And the machinery of quantum uh, control relies on treating this um, goal or this objective as a functional of some external field and then uh, one way to obtain the external field is to use uh, variational calculus. Um, of course, we should also include additional constraints that will allow us to talk to our experimental colleagues and then uh, just use the rules of variational calculus um, and um, get an, a set of coupled equations that we have to solve and that will tell us how to choose this external field. So that's a machinery that is uh, fair, fairly well known to the audience. Now let me make the hour a little bit smaller and uh, refer now to what my own group prefers as uh, our, a major tool for quantum control and that is uh, Kolkhoff's method as Eran already mentioned um, yesterday. And um, Kolkhoff's method is peculiar in the sense that the quantum version of it, so when you apply it to quantum system, works actually uh, better and more straightforward than the original version developed by Kolkhoff for classical mechanics. And the reason for that lies in the compact nature of quantum state space. Christiane? And Yes. Let me interrupt you for a second. Uh, can you move slightly the microphone away from your mouth, your mouth no. because uh, there is a bit of uh, breathing noise? Okay. Is it better like this? Uh, speak again because now it's a bit soft. It's too soft. So this is better. Is this uh, better? Yes. Okay. Better. Thanks, Matthias. Okay. So let's come back to Kotov's method um, and. What the reason why in my group we uh, like it so much is that it's really a very flexible approach that allows you to include nonlinear equations of motion that you have in case of an effective description of quantum systems. It allows you to include dissipation, nonlinear coupling to the controls, and also non-convex target functionals. And let me give you a very first example that uh, Andrea alluded to already yesterday in a slightly different context, and that is we can use now this machinery for the fast and accurate preparation of uh, circular Rydberg states. So we can move in the Rydberg manifold that you've already seen yesterday, and the circular states are the states at the two ends of the diamond here that are particularly protected from decoherence. So preparing them means you're protecting uh, your quantum system. And their name is circular because the orbit of the wave function looks like is indicated here with the nucleus uh, in the middle. And let me just um, really highlight the main points of this joint work, which has been going on for some time between my group and the group at Collège de France, uh, headed by uh, Michel Brun and Sébastien Glaise. So some of you may have seen some of this before. This is the setup for the experiment with the Rydberg atoms. And what I'll show you in a minute is how quantum control um, allows us to do the state preparation more accurate um, and faster than before. And one of the, the main lessons that we learned in this collaboration is in order for um, quantum optimal control theory to be successful in collaboration with experiment, you better make sure that your model captures what's going on in the experiment very well. And one way to check is to apply something that uh, both an experiment and theory is known very well, such as a pi pulse that moves you from this m equals one state here to um, the circular state. And um, this uh, pi pulse, you see, if you would uh, stop it at something like 95 or so uh, nanoseconds, would give you something like 80% um, fidelity and the time scale is of the order of 100 nanoseconds. Now, 80% is not bad, but the question is whether you can do better. So this was the control problem um, that we tackled, and um, you see that we can bring up the fidelity um, 
close to 100%, in theory, of course, uh, very close to 100% in experiment, you have some um, remaining uncertainties in particular for the uh, measurement of the state. And the control protocol that you need that is shown up here is not so difficult. You have a modulation of your controls and then still a flat amplitude like in a Pi pulse. Um, that allows you to prepare a spin coherent state and then rotate the spin coherent state. So we can do the same state preparation that I showed you before for a Pi pulse, but much more accurate. That's nice, but what is more exciting is that you can also prepare states for which you do not have a, a protocol that is known uh, from analytical calculations, for example, like a Pi pulse. So here's another example where we prepared a non-classical superposition state of the circular state shown in black here and the m equals 1 state shown in orange. And we can do this with the same fidelity, about 96-97%, uh, and the control shapes are still comparatively simple with some modulations and then a linear increase um, and decrease in amplitude. So quantum optimal control, if you have uh, a model of your system dynamics that is reliable, really allows you uh, to go wherever you want, in a, even in a large and complex Hilbert space. But from a theoretical point of view, what I've shown you so far is a bit cheating. Because I told you we really have to care about the control of open quantum systems. And the control strategy that I exploited so far was just to beat the coherence by operating really fast. So now let's go um, and think how can we use the same machinery for open systems. And let's first inspect our uh, target functional that was written here with Hilbert space cats. So and coherent evolution. So how do we have to change this slide that I showed you before to account for open quantum system dynamics? And let's pause for a moment and say, well, what this means is really you have to think about how you encode the physics that you want in your optimization functional. And remember that this encoding uh, involves two steps because you have on one hand your final time target, that defines what you want at the final time uppercase T. And you also have this intermediate time contributions that can be um, time dependent costs or also state dependent costs. And both of them are functionals of the external field. Now, if our system is um, undergoes an open system evolution, we have to describe it by a density matrix. Um, so we the time evolution is given in terms of a dynamical map, which can be obtained, for example, by solving uh, a Lindblad master equation, but could also be uh, something more complicated, including uh, memory effects. Now, if you want to go from a given initial state to some final state, then it seems on first glance to be very straightforward uh, to generalize your target from Hilbert space cats to density matrices and say, well, instead of optimizing the scalar product between my uh, propagated state and my target state, I now do the equivalent for density matrices, namely optimize uh, the Hilbert Spit product. There's a pitfall though, and I'll come to that in just a minute. And I just want to mention before going there that you can also um, generalize the gate optimization where you have um, a desired unitary and an actual unitary. You can uh, generalize this to Liouville space in the uh, brute force way. This would be done again via the Hilbert Schmidt product. And now you have here a potentially very large sum. And what we showed a couple of years back is that actually you don't need to do this with a very large sum that is the dimension of your Liouville space, but rather a much smaller number of states um, is sufficient. And you can minimize um, a functional that contains three very specifically chosen states and get the same. Okay, but now let's uh, come back to the problem that you may encounter um, if you're using for the optimization a Hilbert Schmidt product as is shown here for the real part or the absolute um, modulus square of your um, Hilbert Schmidt product. 
because this may actually fail sometimes and it fails whenever your target state itself is not a pure state but is a mixed state and it's very simple to understand this with the example of a qubit that undergoes a single decay, uh, decay channel and we can control this um, decay so let's look at a qubit prepared in the, let's say spin up state and this is our um, decay channel so this relaxes to this uh, mixed state and this may not actually be if you now optimize uh, to reach this uh, target state with a given uh, purity then what your control will do is it will overshoot and not reach that so you really are not getting uh, what you want so a functional based on the Hilbert Schmidt product may not be reliable and you may wonder whether maybe this is not really a meaningful target but I will come to targets where the mixed state uh, assumption is actually meaningful but before that let's see what happens and then let's see how we can remedy this so for any finite dimensional Hilbert space uh, we can expand the state um, in a traceless basis and then get uh, a Bloch sphere um, representation and for a mixed state the Bloch sphere of the target state is of course smaller than that of a pure state now let's assume you have um, a first state that has radius 1 and differs from the target by some angle theta and then you have uh, another state that Make, takes the same angle with our target but has a larger um, radius then you'll see that um, the what matters is the what you would want to matter is the projection onto the target state but what happens if you take the Hilbert Schmidt uh, product is that you always will maximize towards um, this the state that has maximum radius and that's not what you want if you're targeting the green state here so let's make this more uh, quantitative and uh, mathematical what do we need for an optimization functional to be reli reliable well first of all we want the functional to take a real value so that we can measure whether it's better or worse then we want it to be symmetric in the states and the third condition which is the one that's violated in the example um, I just showed you is that it takes its minimum if and if only the two states are identical and if you want to use our optimization functional in a gradient based method such as a grape or Kotov's method then we also want the uh, this distance measure to be um, derivable so that it's, uh, we can take analytical um, derivatives now in quantum information there exists quite a, a large number of distance measures and I listed here a few so the trace distance you may be familiar with or the Burr's distance which is particularly important in quantum sensing or the Hellinger distance the um, John Channon uh, distance and the Hilbert Schmidt distance which differs from the Hilbert Schmidt product because here you really take the difference between two states now if we check these three criteria uh, for reliability we will find that all of these measures are actually reliable but only one of them is derivable so it can be used easily um, in numerical gradient based um, optimal control and that's the Hilbert Schmidt distance so let's use this and if we write this uh, in our block sphere representation then this is how it looks like and our geometrical picture on the Bloch sphere actually suggests that maybe we can use this but we may also want to optimize separately for the angle part in our geometrical picture on the Bloch sphere and the radius part so we want our target state to match both in angle and in radius and we can express this easily in the Bloch vector um, picture and we can also translate this back into the actual um, state vectors given by the density operators as this now let's use this uh, functional these two functionals in an example where you really do have a mixed target state and that is a squeezing in optomechanics 
Let me remind you very briefly what are squeezed states. If you have two non-commuting observables, the most uh, common ones or most well-known ones are, of course, position and uh, momentum, but it may also be amplitude and phase, and there exist many other examples. Then if the variance of the two uh, non-commuting observables is identical and takes the minimum uh, value for this uh, product, then you are in a coherent state. And of course, you always have to obey this Heisenberg uncertainty, but you can also do this with one of the variances being smaller and the other one larger, and that's exactly what is a squeeze state. Um, and already Patrice in the previous talk mentioned that this is a very interesting resource uh, for quantum sensing because it corresponds to having sub-shot noise correlations. Skip this and uh, jump right to our um, application, and that is um, what's called quantum optomechanics or cavity optomechanics, where you couple an optical or microwave uh, cavity to a mechanical resonator indicated by the spring here, and you have a radiative coupling uh, between the two. The most um, famous example that I think all of you now um, know is uh, LIGO that has been used for the sensing of gravitational waves, but there exist many other realizations uh, of uh, force sensors um, or field sensors, and if you're interested in this field, there is a nice overview article. It's a few years back, but it's still uh, regarding the architectures is uh, still an interesting overview. Okay, so let's uh, look at uh, a protocol that produces uh, a squeezed uh, state, and this protocol is due to uh, the Marquardt and Clerk uh, groups, and they considered an optical uh, cavity that is coupled to a mechanical resonator, and both of them are coupled to a reservoir by decay rates kappa and a gamma. And what they saw is that if you're driving your optical cavity at the sidebands, which are defined by taking the difference with respect of the, the two frequencies, and you choose the amplitude of these uh, drives appropriately, then you end up um, for the mechanical oscillator in a squeezed um, state. And because you're pumping into this uh, squeezed state as a steady state, this is an example for what is called quantum reservoir engineering. And it's not just an interesting theory proposal. There also has been an experiment using not an optical cavity, but a microwave cavity. And they could show that, indeed, you can uh, prepare the mechanical resonator in a state where it has less than one phonon in the mechanical uh, mode. So it's really an interesting setup. And now the question is, can we uh, speed up this uh, procedure? So assume that we're starting in a product state. Then the original protocol consists in turning on the red and blue sidebands and wait. And that's slow. So instead now, if we assume the sideband drives to be time dependent, can we accelerate the steady state generation? That's a very natural uh, control uh, problem. And the amplitudes here have been called, and we keep this notation uh, g minus and g plus. So here's the full model. Let me again skip over the details. We have uh, um, decay via Lindblad operators. And the uh, important uh, quantity that uh, uh, quantifies the coupling between the cavity and the resonator and the depends on our drive amplitude is called the cooperativity. Now, when we use um, our optimal control toolbox for this mixed um, state squeezing preparation, we see that we can speed up the uh, approach to the steady state by up to a factor of 100, depending on how strong we drive. So what is shown here is um, the, the cooperativity that is needed to reach a fidelity of the um, steady state of at least less than 10 to the minus 4, and the time that is needed to achieve this. So the more you drive, the faster you can go. And interestingly, we find a power law uh, relation between the cooperativity and the uh, final time. And we did this optimization using both the Hilbert-Schmidt distance and this uh, geometrically um, motivated new functional, and we find control solutions 
that are very similar in both cases. So what is shown uh, in this panel, for example, the blue constant drive was the original uh, protocol, and we find a, a soft modulation around it. Um, that is what gives us uh, the speed up. And we see that we um, reach the target state um, also in terms of the purity that uh, we expect the steady state to reach. And just to illustrate once more the failure of the um, Hilbert-Schmidt product uh, distance, you see that you're overshooting in purity and um, you're not reaching uh, the kind of squeezing that you want. Now, let me highlight one point that is important for um, optimization uh, theory, and that is we optimize here using the Hilbert-Schmidt distance and this uh, split functional, but we had all these other distance measures that quantify how far we are from the target state. And we see that all of these other measures are minimized as well. That's not guaranteed, but it's a very nice feature that we can exploit uh, later on. So let me just briefly summarize this example. Um, you need to be careful to define your optimization target when you look at mixed target states. And in the case of optomechanics, we found that you can uh, speed up easily within a factor of 200 uh, within staying um, within experimental feasibility. Now let me come to the last example of this talk, and that is uh, how we can use quantum control to improve state distinguishability in quantum sensing uh, protocols. So the typical um, task in quantum sensing is that you have um, a system that undergoes evolution with an unknown field, and we characterize this here by two different fields, B1 and B2, that differ by a quantity delta B that we don't know. And they're subject to the same controls that can couple in all three directions. So we are, want to simultaneously control um, two, two qubit states, and we want their evolution to make the states as distinguishable at final time as possible, because that will give rise to the highest signal-to-noise ratio in quantum sensing. And we can do this using the Hilbert-Schmidt uh, distance, as I um, showed you before. So that's what we're exploiting here. And we first look at um, this, such a, a sensing protocol, assuming that the qubits undergo T1 decay. And now, depending on the difference uh, in your field that you want to be able to resolve on this delta B here, you need a certain minimum amount of time to make this uh, state distinguishable, which is shown by this uh, shape of the curves um, here. So we find um, that depending on the, on the uh, size of the, the field that we want to measure, there is a minimum time that we need to distinguish to resolve that field. That's nothing but the famous uh, quantum speed limit. But what we also see is that if we optimize for longer and uh, uh, protocol duration, so longer than this minimum time, we can actually stabilize the distinguishability um, despite the T1 decay. And that was a bit of a surprise to us when we did this. And it's really a stabilization, so if we check the purity of the state, then it does stay constant uh, beyond these uh, minimum times here. How do the optimized fields look like? Well, we compare here the gas field, which is uh, a Ramsey-like sequence, to our optimized uh, field, and we see that, well, they are quite different, but still really uh, simple control fields. And we also find that actually a single control field, just coupling to uh, sigma y in that case, is sufficient. We can do the same, assuming pure dephasing, characterized by decay time t2. And we see very similar features. So we have a minimum time, and we can stabilize uh, the protocol, even though uh, the purity phasing is acting on our system. Also in this case, the shape of the field looks uh, fairly simple, and again, a single control field is sufficient, this time coupling to sigma x. And um, what is important is that we can now exploit the fact that minimization of the Hilbert-Schmidt distance was equivalent to the Beer's distance that I, we found in this previous example on the squeezing. 
And now the burst distance in quantum sensing is directly related to the quantum fissure information, which characterizes a metrological gain. So we can now plot this metrological gain as a function of the protocol duration. And we see that if we're using these optimized fields and we are willing to wait a bit longer, then we get a metrological gain, which is shown here in the difference between these dotted curves, which represent the Ramsey protocol to the solid lines, which are um, our optimized curves given uh, a minimum um, amount of field strength that we want to be able to resolve. How are we are, um, achieving this metrological gain? Well, for this, it's useful to look at the time evolution. I show here the time evolution with respect to the T1 decay. And in that case, we actually do have a decoherence-free subspace which is the uh, zero state down here. So what actually happens is that the control protocol is storing the states close to this um, decoherence-free subspace before bringing it back at the time when we want to measure and making them as distinguishable as possible. The strategy is very... Rough. Roughly 30 minutes are over. Yeah. I'm almost finished, thank you very much. Um, the strategy is very similar um, if you look at uh, dephasing, it's just that the decoherence-free subspace now um, is a different one. So in both cases, T1 decay and T2 dephasing, the stabilization um, of the distinguishability is achieved by staying close to a decoherence-free subspace. So with this, I'm already um, at the summary of um, this last example. So in, when using optimal control theory for quantum sensing, we find two improvements with respect to the Ramsey protocol. And we were able to do this using the um, optimal control machinery, in this case, really our uh, favorite tool, Kotov's method. And these two improvements consist in increasing the overall achievable state distinguishability at the expense of slightly longer protocol durations. And we can stabilize the state distinguishability at its maximum for times which are longer, at least an order of magnitude, than the decay time. And these two uh, improvements um, can be realized with comparatively simple, intelligible, and experimentally feasible pulse shapes. And with this, I come to the summary of uh, my overall talk. So um, I showed you uh, three examples, one very briefly where we use optimal control to operate at the quantum speed limit and this way beat the coherence. And the example was the preparation of uh, Rydberg states. Then I discussed an example of uh, quantum reservoir engineering where we used optimal control to uh, approach the steady state faster than before. We have another example um, in my group's work on trapped ions that I didn't discuss today, but that uh, you can look up in case you're interested, where we also uh, can identify which is the quantum reservoir uh, protocol that we need to, um, in this case, generate entanglement. And finally, I showed you how we can use optimal control to protect against decay by operating close to a decoherence-free subspace, and that can be harnessed for improved sensitivity in quantum sensing. Now here's a picture um, of our group and the Rydberg uh, example was uh, done by Sabrina uh, in collaboration with the group at the uh, Collège de France uh, in Paris. The rest of the talk is really the graduate work of uh, Daniel Basilevich who uh, just finished his uh, PhD thesis. This picture was taken back when the group was still in Kassel. As you may know, we have recently moved to Berlin and we are now uh, busy trying to get the TV tower of Berlin into a non-classical uh, quantum superposition. And with this, um, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot, Christiane. Thanks a lot for showing us many uh, examples of how to use quantum control for quantum sensing and optimal uh, for open system quantum control. So I would have a question concerning the the norms that you have and the minimization yeah. protocols, because you said the Hilbert-Schmidt norm is the one that you can use, where the others are more complicated. Is there an easy way to see why, why this one is better than the others? Yes. 
you see what the others have in common? They have this nasty square root. Yeah, so and that causes then really numerical problems that you exactly the convergence. Exactly. It's uh, exactly. So it's the uh, discontinuity, to be precise, that is hidden in this uh, square root and that you cannot um, easily get rid of. But so it's, it's really just a numerical problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in principle, that doesn't matter because you say you get the same conclusions no matter which one you would take. So in our optimization examples, we found that it really doesn't matter, but you have no rigorous uh, mathematical guarantee for that because the, the, each of these distances measures something slightly different. Um, but I think that the reason why in the end it does work is that what you're looking for um, in, in, in optimal control is not the exact size of the epsilon sphere around your target, uh, which is different for these different measures, but what you're looking for is the right direction, and apparently um, this right direction um, is captured sufficiently well by the Hilbert Schmidt distance. Okay. Is there, is there questions from the audience? Yeah, Federico, you were first. Um, yeah, hello, Christiane. Thanks for the great talk. I just wanted to ask um, regarding the last example and the decoherence-free subspaces. So definitely I have some intuition for why the zero state is decoherence-free from relaxation effects, but um, I don't see how the I think is it the the x yeah the plus state is free from the phasing. Is this just a numerical? So so is this just a result of the way the Markovian noise is implemented in some uh, master equation, or is it actually would this also be true in experiment? If you have an experiment that is subject to pure dephasing, then um, this would also be true because then, I mean, the, the of course, to, to be an exact decoherence-free subspace, uh, um, that is de determined by your Lindblad operators, okay? But if we assume that, th that this uh, model for the decay is uh, an appropriate one, then you should also be able to find this decoherence-free subspace in experiment. And I think what is really the interesting point here is because, the, of course, our model is with, with uh, just a qubit evolution undergoing T1 decay or T pure dephasing is, is really simple, but the, the, the main message is that um, in quantum sensing, it really makes sense to exploit the coherence-free subspaces. So, so if you know of a decoherence-free subspace, um, then go and use it. And um, we have another uh, ongoing project that has been ongoing uh, for some while, but we still hope that we can make uh, progress there. And that is to use optimal control to actually identify these decoherence-free um, subspaces in uh, more complex um, systems. But that's, of course, a whole uh, task and a whole problem in its own. Thanks so much. Eugenio, sorry for not... Uh, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hi. Thanks, Christiane, yeah, for the you... talk. And uh, I was... Uh, I was. Uh, I have two questions. The first one was uh, actually regarding um, Stefan, Stefan's remark. Uh, maybe it's just... Uh, I, I don't know if it makes sense, but um, why can't we, can't we take just like to... Um, the square of this uh, distances to to avoid um, square roots. It's that does it make because usually distances have always uh, singularities in the origin. It's it's, uh, it's typical, but sometimes one takes a square root, a uh, square uh, the, the power. Of, sure, but even if you take the square root, even if you take the square, uh, if you if you square the the root, um, you would still have a, a discontinuity. So you don't have a smooth uh, variation. That's the the issue here. Okay. Okay. And uh, and con concerning the 
the coherent free self space. Uh, so it's interesting because we we were thinking about uh, something um, in contrast also with with uh, Mario Nugat was about taking a, a two level system but with um, with a state with uh, with uh, with this person with just one state of of this person in some sense. So here you are taking state one one state one. Uh, the span of one of one state will be unitary in some sense. Will, will uh, I'm not quite so sure what you mean by dispersion because so we do have separate um, time evolution um, drifts, right? So we have each of the states undergoes a slightly different evolution. So it's really the question of uh, simultaneous control, um, and and maybe the interesting angle here is that you don't know what is your target state and you don't really care also all that you care about is that the final state of these uh, two qubits undergoing slightly different evolution is to make them as different as possible so that's what we're doing here but the dispersion okay. i think is already exactly what you're i mean you have an ensemble of just two states in this case um, and you want to make uh, these, the, the time evolution of these two states as uh, as distinguishable as possible. Okay. Okay. But but we can it. also Thank discuss you. this uh, together with uh, um, Ugo and Mario at some point later. Yes. Yes. Of course. So Thank you. We had one more question, Aaron. We had two more questions, but I think I would like to postpone the other one for the uh, breakout sessions. So, Aaron. Um, hi. Um, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, uh, so, this, with regards to the squeezing uh, uh, research uh, that you, you presented, um, so uh, you stressed that it, it, it requires to use the, the, the mixed state formalism. Um, but what I'm a little bit confused about is that the squeezing states themselves, they are unitary, they are, I mean, they are coherent states. They can be produced by a squeezing operator. So what I'm trying to understand is what part of the state space uh, we are actually able to control uh, in this. So case. in in this specific model, maybe we have to go um, here to to see this a little bit better. Um, there is actually a trade-off, and I think that's what makes this an interesting control problem also. And that is a trade-off between purity and squeezing. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a, a fully pure state, then your squeezing vanishes. So it's mm -hmm. that's that's not what you want. But this, I mean, it's, it's really mm. something specific to this uh, that's mm -hmm. modeled by by Marquardt and and, and Clark. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Since we have a minute, so Jesper, as the last question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah. Fantastic. Thank you for the overview of your latest work, Christian. That was very interesting. Um, I just had a quick question for your experimental collaboration. Uh, so you mentioned, of course, that when you do any kind of theory and you have to actually put it into an experiment, you have to have a good sort of um, theoretical model of, of what you are doing. And I was just wondering if you could uh, briefly sort of um, highlight what kind of uh, things you took into consideration, uh, for example, you talked about you you did you did things that were easy on both sides, so you sort of calibrated on a common ground. And I was just wondering if you could maybe explain a bit more uh, how that process went and what you uh, yeah that general process. So we would have liked to take everything into account, but um, our experimental uh, friends were not willing to. Um, fully determine the device response because I think it's just as as you know very well is super tedious and and not very rewarding to do that um, so the more practical strategy in this case turned out to be uh, to make the controls as simple as possible so okay. so you see that uh, for example here in the beginning of our time evolution um, the the model and the the, the measurements do not agree super well, but this may actually, or most likely after going back and forth uh, a couple of times, um, 
we are pretty convinced that this is a problem of the measurement and not of the control. So we decided to live with it. So um, but, but you get you you get very smooth controls. Is that that just due to regularization penalties? No, so actually or, we, the, 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 the crucial step in getting uh, very smooth controls was to, to go to the rotating frame and optimize within the rotating frame. That already was sufficient. Okay. So we didn't even need further constraints. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this, let's thank Christiane and also Patrice from uh, speakers for the sessions again. I clap hands. You can clap as well. And so we are all.